The Back to the Future on-screen mythology may have wrapped up with Back to the Future 3, but in 1991 and 1992, fans of Back to the Future got to break the boundaries of the space-time continuum once again in the Back to the Future animated series. Where this time we follow the lives of the Brown household, consisting of Doc, Clara, Einstein, and their sons, Jules and Vern. Along with Marty, who tags along for the ride, where the family often finds themselves on misadventures throughout time, where they must often go against villainous members of the Biff Tannen family. For better or worse, the Back to the Future cartoon took more of a wacky comedy approach, with a great deal of the main focus being on Jules and Vern. Once again, with an emphasis on for better or worse. So it's time to explore this often forgotten about and obscure chapter in the history of Back to the Future. One thing is for sure, I find the Back to the Future cartoon series to be really fascinating. It just went in different directions and tangents that I honestly wouldn't have expected Back to the Future to go into. So today we are going to explore this weird anomaly into the Back to the Future lore by looking into 10 things that you didn't know about the Back to the Future animated series. So buckle up you crazy drunk viewers, as we check it out. Number 10, the first cartoon series for a new animation company. So the Back to the Future film series may have wrapped up in 1990 with Back to the Future Part 3, with everything nicely finished, signed, sealed and delivered, with no more adventures for Doc and Marty. However, that didn't mean that we couldn't see any animated Back to the Future adventures on the small screen. Enter the new Universal Studios animated division, Universal Cartoon Studios. The company was set up in 1990, and what better way to get this new studio started with a bang than to produce a Back to the Future series. After all, everyone loves Back to the Future, and who wouldn't want to see more of Doc and Marty? Universal Cartoon Studios actually produced several animated TV shows based on popular movies throughout the 90s, of which were movies that Universal had produced, including An American Tale, Problem Child, Beethoven, Casper the Friendly Ghost, and The Mummy. Back to the Future director and co-writer Robert Zemeckis and fellow co-writer and producer Bob Gale were credited as creating the show on the account that they both created the Back to the Future franchise and both Gale and Steven Spielberg who was an executive producer on the movies acted as producers on the animated series with the cartoon also being co-developed by Amblin Television which was also making strides in the world of animation at that time as the company was also producing the popular Tiny Toons and animation Maniacs cartoons. The Back to the Future series was broadcast on Saturday mornings on CBS. And 13 of the show's episodes were directed by Peyton Reed, who would go on to direct the Ant-Man movies. And some of the episodes were even directed by Gale too. When reflecting upon the animated series, and where it fits in with the Back to the Future lore, Bob Gale explains that it's an alternative what-if timeline, not connected to the movies or future comic series. Number 9, Returning Cast So the big question probably on everyone's minds in the production of the Back to the Future cartoon is, which actors from the original movies could they get to return? Well, Thomas F. Wilson, who played the Tannen family in the three movies, and Mary Steenburgen, who played Clara Clayton in Back to the Future 3, both returned to lend their voices in the series, with Wilson playing several variations of Biff that Marty and the Browns encounter through time, and Steenburgen returning as Clara, who is now Doc's wife. Supposedly, Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd were too busy to lend their voices to their characters. But Christopher Lloyd did return to film live-action sequences, which were featured at the start and end of each episode. The manner in which these sequences were filmed were incredibly rushed, due to Lloyd having such a limited time, and it does really show. But damn it if it isn't just so much fun seeing Lloyd as Doc, looking as if he had just walked off the set of Back to the Future 2 and 3. 
Now this idea of a cartoon having live action segments both at the start and end of a cartoon series was previously done with the Super Mario Bros. Super Show a few years earlier. But not only would the Back to the Future live action sequences feature some wacky gags and scenarios, but also science experiments too, ones that the kids could try out at home and join in. Of which featured none other than Bill Nye the Science Guy. In fact, this was his screen debut. I've often heard people say that they've tried the experiments at home. Yeah, but look, personally I was too lazy and couldn't be bothered. And I was just happy watching Bill Nye do all the work. Number 8. New Voice Cast So what new voice talent could the Back to the Future cartoon bring to the table to help recreate the well-loved characters from the movies? Well, Doc was voiced by actor and comedian Dan Castellaneta, aka that guy who voices Homer. Yeah, Homer does the voice of Doc, and to be fair, he actually does a pretty good Christopher Lloyd impersonation. And at that time he voiced Doc, it still would have actually been the early days of The Simpsons. Marty was voiced by David Kaufman, who lent his voice to many characters in his career, including Jimmy Olsen in the Superman animated series. He also voiced Stuart Little in a Stuart Little cartoon, <laughs> once again replacing a Michael J. Fox character for the small screen. Jules was voiced by Josh Keaton. He has voiced many characters over the years for animated features, as well as several superheroes, including the Green Lantern, Spider-Man, Ant-Man, Cyclops, and Steve Rogers, among many more. Marty's girlfriend Jennifer does turn up every once in a while in the show, and she was voiced by Kathy Cavadini, who has also done lots of voice work, including voicing Blossom in the Powerpuff Girls. Number 7. Deviations Okay, so the Back to the Future movies had a pretty basic setup. Doc and Marty travel in time in a DeLorean time machine, where they have many misadventures. That right there should be the plot for the cartoon, and it's actually a plot that you can do so much with, and explore so many avenues that weren't explored in the movies. And wow, the Back to the Future cartoon might have just had the most unfortunate and misguided direction that it could have possibly gone into as the cartoon decides to mainly focus on Jules and Vern, Doc's boys that we see briefly in the last two minutes of the entire trilogy. And even within that time, one of them spends most of their screen time pointing at their junk and pulling faces. Yeah, this series takes more of a domestic approach, where we mainly focus on the Brown household, who now live on a farm in Hill Valley. Where, as mentioned, Jules and Vern pretty much hijack the show. Hey, if I'm watching a Back to the Future cartoon, I want it to be about Doc and Marty. Not those weird kids that we see at the very end of Back to the Future Part 3. And what doesn't help is I always found Jules and Vern to be incredibly obnoxious and unlikable. Seriously, who okayed this direction for the show? Okay, to be fair, apparently the script writing process and trying to come up with a premise of the show was quite a turbulent, wild ride. And I think it shows. That'll explain why the show went in such a bizarre direction. Maybe it was felt that because it's a cartoon, kids needed other kids to watch and relate to. But regardless, this was such a misstep of a direction for the show to go in. And then there's Marty. So, yeah, about that. Marty is pretty much a side character in his own show. And what's worse is they made the character a complete and utter doofus. A bumbling, hapless, comical buffoon is really tragic. I mean, how do you take one of the coolest and most street smart characters in movie history and turn him into a complete nincompoop? Even as a kid, I found this interpretation of Marty to be, well, for lack of a better word, painful. The steam train seen at the end of the trilogy returns, which is cool, as I always wanted to see more of that, and so does the DeLorean, be that a new DeLorean. Only this one is riddled with gadgets, of which it can now fold up into a briefcase. Um, okay. And it can now travel through time and space, to different locations other than Hill Valley. So basically, it's the TARDIS. I love how in the intro we see Doc involved in a hit and run by running some guy over. Look at that, Doc totally committed vehicular manslaughter. Oh, and Dog's Doc Einstein seems to be more anamorphic and at times can move around like a human. Look, I know the Back to the Future movies could be comical at times, but they were still grounded within their own realities. Like, 
It wouldn't have made sense for the DeLorean to suddenly fold up into a briefcase. Or have Einstein driving the steam train like an actual person. This honestly feels less Back to the Future and more Looney Tunes. Number 6. Deleted Character now IMDB offers some interesting information in that the show was to feature an additional character which ended up being written out, that being a character called Polly Clayton, as theorised by the website, obviously a character who is in some way related to Clara. The character is also described as being 9 years old, and it was probably intended to have a young female character that little girls watching could relate to, but that's just a guess. So who knows why the character was written out? Maybe because there was already so much focus put on Jules and Vern, and they probably thought there was already enough kids running around as it was. Polly isn't the only deleted character, but actually characters from the movies are nowhere to be seen. Those being Marty's parents, George and Lorraine McFly, who despite being popular characters in the movies, are nowhere to be seen. Yep, George and Lorraine seem to suffer the same fate as Adam and Barbara in the Beetlejuice cartoon, as characters who have suddenly disappeared without a trace. But then again, the cartoon was more about the Browns than it was the McFlys. Number 5. The Cartoon Answers a Back to the Future Mystery Ever wondered what the L in Doc's name stands for? After all, in the movies, he's known as Dr. Emmett L. Brown, without ever discovering what the L stands for. Could it be Larry, or Lawrence, or Lovejoy? Well, if this is a mystery that's been keeping you up all night, then the cartoon has you covered, in which in the series it's learned that his middle name is Lathrop. Yep, all this time his name was Emmett Lathrop Brown. In fact, this is actually a callback to a deleted subplot in Back to the Future Part 3, where in 1885 Doc meets a little girl called Sarah Lathrop, who actually turns out to be Doc's mother. The revelation in the cartoon is a nice callback to the original Back to the Future 3 script. Also in the cartoon we learn that Marty's middle name is Seamus. Once again, another little callback to Back to the Future 3. Although one thing I couldn't figure out is why is Marty now wearing a red and yellow letterman jacket? What about his iconic look of a denim jacket with that red life preserver? Or his 2015 jacket? Why this letterman jacket? We've never seen him wear that in the movies. Well, my theory is this. Whoever designed Marty's attire for the cartoon had memories of Michael J. Fox wearing a red and yellow letterman jacket on the Teen Wolf poster, and he had that in mind when designing the character and basically got the two franchises mixed up and thus accidentally gave Marty the jacket that Fox was wearing on the Teen Wolf poster. And in addition to that, there actually was a Teen Wolf cartoon, which also gave us one of Fox's characters, this time being Scott Howard, with the red and yellow letterman jacket. Despite the fact that in the movie itself the character never wears a red and yellow letterman jacket. It was actually blue and yellow. Damn, all these mysterious red and yellow letterman jackets turning up in cartoons for characters who never actually wore them. Seriously, what is up with all these random red and yellow letterman jackets just turning up? It's weird. Number 4. Merchandise. The Back to the Future cartoon also got adapted into a series of Harvey comics, just as the comic brand had previously done with Beetlejuice and, um, New Kids on the Block? Sure, why not? And the comics pretty much continue the zany adventures of the Brown family and Marty, for all those who just needed to see more animated Back to the Future adventures. It has the same look and humour of the show, and it is beautifully illustrated, with it looking like the characters have left the screen and arrived on the printed page. In addition to that, Universal started releasing some of the episodes on VHS and Laserdisc, with each release consisting of two episodes. Well, four if you wanted to splash out and advance to Laserdisc. Say what you want to say about the cartoon, the artwork on the covers are beautifully illustrated. But what about action figures? Surely in that era, the day and age of action figures, the time was ripe for a Doc and Marty action figure toy lineup, as well as a toy DeLorean to put them in and go on time adventures, right? Well, no, that didn't happen. Number three, no one got action figures except for McDonald's. So now that Back to the Future was in a kids-centric medium with the Back to the Future cartoon, you would think that it was the perfect time to produce Back to the Future action figures so kids at home can create their own adventures within the space-time continuum and not have to pretend that the sticks that you find outside are Doc and Marty. 
After all, a similar thing happened to Ghostbusters, in which the advent of a cartoon led to that property finally getting figures. Well, the Back to the Future cartoon did end up getting action figures, but not until 2020. Yep, nearly 30 years after the cartoon was originally broadcast. The lineup was made by NECA, and consisted of action figures of Marty, Doc and Einstein, and Biff. But at this stage, you could already get a plethora of Back to the Future figures based on the movies, which I think is probably what people would have wanted the most. So I guess in the early 90s, it was felt that there just wasn't a demand for Back to the Future action figures. However, if you really, really needed some Back to the Future figures of some kind, any kind, then good old Mackie D's had you covered, or as it's called in Australia, Maccas, or as my dad called it when I was a kid, Mook Chuck Ups, as McDonald's released a string of Happy Meal toys based on the Back to the Future cartoon, and considering the Back to the Future series didn't feature the penguin puking up green slime, the Happy Meal deal wasn't cut short, where you could get mini toys of Marty, Doc, Einstein, and... Vern. Okay. Oddly, Jules is missing. So if you wanted your own Marty and Doc and Vern, then, then all you had to do was make a trip to your local Maccas. Number two, the Back to the Future series won a heap of awards. Now, the Back to the Future series may not have been to my personal liking, with me feeling like it just totally went in the wrong direction for a Back to the Future cartoon and was really misguided, it seems that others really did in fact love it. Hey, I guess it's all about tastes and perspectives. The Back to the Future animated series won two Daytime Emmy Awards in 1992, one for sound mixing and the other for sound editing, and then a further two Emmy Awards in 1993, once again for sound mixing and the other being for sound editing. Wow, whoever was in charge of those Emmy Awards sure did like the sound of the Back to the Future cartoon, didn't they? Number one, Forgotten in Time. The Back to the Future animated series original run lasted for two seasons, starting in December 1991 and finishing in December 1992, consisting of 26 episodes. Since then, the show has kind of slipped into obscurity. I mean, I personally never hear anyone talking about it. The film series is still widely praised and celebrated in the pop cultural landscape, of which still has many conventions, celebrations, and even documentaries, some of which are just purely about people talking about just how much they love the film series. So for such a loved franchise, how has the Back to the Future series slipped through the cracks into obscurity? Once again, a piece of extended media based on Back to the Future. You would think that would be a big deal. Well, just going by my own thoughts of the show, I think it goes back to the show just went into misguided directions for a Back to the Future cartoon. I can remember seeing an advertisement for the Back to the Future cartoon in a comic book, and just getting really excited about it. The picture just captured the mood and tone of the Back to the Future movies, and perfectly demonstrated what those movies could have looked like in cartoon format. And to me, it just felt right to now get a Back to the Future cartoon. Yeah, I was totally on board for this. But when I saw it, the look and style of the cartoon just felt off. It had an animation style which looked kind of Nickelodeon-ish. Not saying there's anything wrong with that, it just didn't think that that style suited Back to the Future. And it also had its wacky slapstick oddball comedy, which to me just felt out of place. And of course the fact that Marty wasn't like how he was in the movie, and took a back seat to Jules and Vern. It just felt wrong. The general aesthetic of the show just felt off and not in alignment with the movies. Also notice how in the original advertisement for the TV show, Jules and Vern are nowhere to be seen, like they've been wisely removed. I think the show felt more focused on gags than it did fun and adventure, and the general spirit of those movies that it's based on. Take fellow cartoon based off a 1980s movie, The Real Ghostbusters. Yes, it has lots of humour and can be slapstick at times, but it also knew not to stray too far away from its original source material. It still treated its story and characters with dignity and respect and felt grounded. Grounded within the bounds of its own universe. Also, when it comes to the Back to the Future cartoon, there are just other minor little things, or seemingly minor little things, that still just baffle me. Like really strange creative decisions that I just for the life of me can't figure out. 
like I couldn't figure out why the music in the intro was a rendition of Back in Time. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the original Huey Lewis and the News song Back in Time, but why not use the Back to the Future theme? When you think of Back to the Future, what's the first thing that comes into your head? The adventurous and powerful Back to the Future theme by Alan Silvestri? Or that song that's played at the end of the very first movie? I mean, heck, it would have made more sense to go with Power of Love. And this wasn't a copyright issue, as the theme does feature in the show, only it takes a back seat and is played at the end. But, I have to stress this. I don't hate this cartoon, and I still think that it was made with love. I think the powers that be went out to make a fun and entertaining TV show that extends on Back to the Future. But in my opinion, they just went the wrong way about it. And although I don't think the animation style is in alignment with its source material, it is still fun and energetic. And I also understand that there are many people out there who grew up with this cartoon and do actually absolutely love it. So I think the best way to watch the Back to the Future cartoon is to not think you're watching something like the movies, but more in line with the Beetlejuice cartoon, in that it's really wacky with its oddball humour. As well as other wacky strange cartoons based on movies like The Mask and Dumb and Dumber. And when you look at it from that perspective, I think you can have a good time and just see it as a zany comedy. And I just want to add, once again, I don't think the animated series is bad, it's just misguided. But I do think it's a shame and wasted opportunity, as a Back to the Future cartoon could have been really spectacular. Maybe even platinum. Like the Back to the Future movies, the cartoon did utilise comedy, but it also forgot the most important ingredients that those movies had. The heart. So, you'll probably notice that I've said misguided a lot in this episode. Well, that's because I do think it's the perfect word to sum up the Back to the Future series. But despite all that, I do actually really enjoy discussing the Back to the Future cartoon. Because I love Back to the Future and it is part of the Back to the Future lore. And so I do find this to be a very fascinating chapter. So I'm happy the cartoon series exists for that, so we can have this interesting chat. Anyway, I'm Minty, and Greg Scott! No, seriously, there's Scott! See? There's Scott, and, well, he's pretty great. Great Scott. See ya!